Welcome to the Trauma Informed Lens Podcast. Each week, Matt, Kurt, Jerry, and the occasional special guest explore how the trauma informed paradigm challenges traditional beliefs and approaches concerning a wide variety of areas. This podcast addresses psychological trauma in an educational manner and is not designed to replace mental health treatment. If anything in this podcast makes you feel uncomfortable or anxious, please talk to a mental health professional. Welcome, friends, to episode 19 of the Trauma Informed Lens podcast. Uh, I'm here today with Kurt. You just got us two today. So we expect to be really succinct, organized, and to the point. Uh, uh, but we wish our friend Jerry well, as always. So uh, welcome. We're going to talk today about, uh, we're going to talk today about talking about trauma. Um, one of the things um, that we're, we're sort of celebrating, or, or Kurt is nice enough to celebrate with me, is I got my new book came in the mail today. Uh, and so it has a little strip around it because it's uh, just going official uh, without the strip. But uh, Amazon was nice enough to send me a copy. So yeah, the, the book that I just published um, is called Talking About Trauma and Change. And it comes from me really doing work directly with those in services and training them about trauma. And so in today's episode, we're, Kurt and I are going to talk about some experiences that we've had and, and how you can consider taking the information you're learning from this podcast and other sources and, and how do we educate, uh, when I was in college, we called this psychoeducational groups, but how do you help uh, uh, people going into services students in schools understand the impact of trauma on their own neurobiology and well-being, and some insights um, that we've had through, through our work. But as always, bright, shiny objects of the week. So, uh, Kurt, uh, what are you thinking about this week? <laughs> well, certainly, I want to start out by saying congratulations to you on obviously a bright, shiny object, not just of a week, but of a long, many weeks. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank so, you. I... I <laughs> I just, I, in, one, in, in many ways, Matt, I, I look up to you and I, I like, like watching what you do and you do lots of things that I aspire to do maybe one day. And, and writing books is something that, I, it's something, it's like a process I don't understand how you would do it. Um, so it's kind of like writing a song, right? I wouldn't even know where to start, where yes. people who are songwriters, they know how to do it. Yeah. Uh, so I, I, love, I love being able to um, be engaged with somebody like you who's doing these things that I'm not doing and I get to learn and watch and um, so congratulations to you and what an incredible accomplishment to now have two out there and it's, yes. it's really really cool. Well, and, well thank you so much my friends those words mean a lot and and so but besides the book um, the, the one thing I actually have a prop for those that have on video today but I have a weighted and it's like a weightlifting thing, a weighted blanket. Uh, I, I got this sucker for my birthday back in November from my wife. And um, we've talked about a little bit at the show, and I know Kurt and I, we, we kind of share this, this experience, is one of the things that really helped, I think, my thinking around trauma, um, emotional regulation, uh, just a, a lot of things was occupational therapy, um, especially working with highly autistic children, uh, uh, kids in special education. I just saw weighted vest, weighted blankets, uh, things where they can kind of move around. My wife does this with her uh, first graders as well, but these little platforms that aren't steady when you sit down, so you're kind of always moving. And, and I really got into sensory, um, sensory work with, with that, the occupational therapist that I've worked with. And um, I'm a guy who always loves to sleep under like all the blankets, but I'm also like married to a woman who like, she radiates like 300 degree heat at night. So I always like just have a sheet on and so, uh, I've got this 60 pound blanket now and it has really, really helped. Um, and so I think just as a bright shiny object for me, it was cool that they're not cheap and I'm really freakishly tall. So I could buy, it had to be a gift because I was too cheap to buy it on my own, but I, it was such a wonderful gift and I'm sleeping really well. And I just like, it's kind of funny. I, my wife calls it my blankie now because um, I took it on a trip with me once. And, uh, you know, on those cold days, we, we sometimes get here in Colorado. I just love to, if I'm watching the game or something or a, a Netflix, just to curl up on the couch with a 60-pound blanket. So, 
my dogs don't seem to like it as much as I do. But uh, <laughs> so yeah, that's my bright, shiny object of the week. And just a shout out to all the occupational therapists out there. You hold a, I hold you in very high regard. So, <laughs> so, so our, our topic for this week, I'm just going to give you a little bit of a background. I'm, I'm not here, obviously, to sell a book. Though if you want one, you could buy one on Amazon. Um, I won't turn you down. Yeah, I know. I won't turn you down. Amazon's <laughs> open. Um, and, and so, you know, part of this journey to, um, and this, you know, the subtitle of this is Connecting Paradigm Supplement, which was the book I put out um, earlier this year. And one of the things that I realized as I was writing uh, Connecting Paradigms, the, the original book, um, and that's all about how we talk to, to clients, students about change that have trauma in their history, um, is that all of a sudden I have all these analogies that I love. Um, the cup analogy, I, I use something sometimes, the hero's journey. I have all these things that I, I really come to, uh, I, they're kind of like my kids I joke about because I have to decide which ones to bring to trainings with me. And they just, when I tried to put them in the original book, it, it just sort of lost the focus of the book. Uh, the, the book is a real skill-based book and with all these analogies, the feedback I was getting from some of my first editors was it just kind of slowed things down. And when you talk about neurobiology and change and trauma and mindfulness, there are already so many concepts that I, I started to cut these out. And, and after I got the first book published and, and you know, had joy for, for months about just saying I published a book, uh, I, I just realized I had all this stuff on the cutting room floor that I thought could be really useful for folks. Um, and because and they've been useful for me over the years. And, and about this time, too, I've had this experience several times over the last few years. I've been asked to do trainings, more or less, for people in services, um, usually residential housing programs or substance abuse mental health programs. Um, uh, you know, you, mostly with adults, but, but teens as well, um, that are already in higher level of services. And um, the first time I did this, I was nervous, and I don't usually get nervous, and a friend a friend, a therapist of mine who's working in a residential treatment center said, hey, Matt, just come in and I'll never forget her words because I knew exactly what she meant. She's like, just bring Matt. <laughs> I'm like, you don't want therapist, Matt? No. She says, bring the Matt that you bring to other trainings. And so I PowerPointed it up. I, uh, I tucked in my shirt. I, I ironed. I did everything that I normally do. And about, you know, as a presenter who presents in front of thousands of people a year, you kind of feel things change in your audience at times. I just felt about halfway through this like 80 minute initial presentation is something's going on here, but I didn't quite get it through the interactions. But after the training, I had about a dozen people come up to me uh, again, who were struggling with addiction and a lot of other issues surrounding that and said, you know, now that I understand the, the impact of trauma on my brain, I realized for the first time in my life, I'm not a bad person. And I'm like, and as a therapist, I try to, I try to kind of think out how many therapy sessions I, I often had to have before I could have somebody get that realization. And boy, if I could get that in like 80 minutes by doing a psychoeducation, that's pretty powerful. And so I've been playing around with idea, uh, these ideas about how we communicate all this knowledge that, that we talk about on this podcast and this coming out to the folks that, that are actually in services. And, and is there a real, in some ways, liberating or beneficial impact um, uh, uh, to doing so? Um, and Kurt, I want to throw it over to, to you as well and, and just get some any kind of you know, thoughts that you might have or experiences you might have about teaching people about their neurobiology and how that might give them insight to their emotions um, and behaviors. Yeah, I'll, I'll kind of go um, a little bit back to you mentioning an occupational therapy. And yeah. Typically, you know, sensory integration as well. Yeah. Um, and, and I talk a little bit about kind of what I think, how I think of what my mission is and what I'm passionate about. Yeah. A lot of what I'm passionate about as a board certified behavior analyst is getting behavior analysis into these other areas that aren't typically you would get yeah. behavior analysis into. And I love having interaction and integration between disciplines. I think it's so important. So when you mentioned um, sensory integration, I thought of this wonderful, wonderful occupational therapist that I've worked with over the years. And, and uh, 
where we had some really great discussions about sensory integration and sensory diets. And one of the cool things that we were able to integrate was to be able to find out if we did a sensory intervention, was it actually a regulating event or was it an activating event? Mm. And so it was really cool. We used heart rate. Yeah. So we just had, we, we, we would do the event and measure heart rate before and after and find out what happened. And so tying those things together from the measurement standpoint, which is kind of my behavioral world, and this really cool intervention that her argument was actually she was she's a very very systematic thinking kind, yes. of, kind of person so that was really fun for me and as we did that right what we were really thinking was from a trauma-informed perspective which is what you're what we are kind of your question you're asking is if yeah. we learn about the inner workings of the body and then we find that the things that happen inside the skin follow physical laws and they follow, they're just like physical events that happen outside the skin. Mm -hmm. And we can understand them. We have technology now that gives us the ability to observe them and to measure them. Yeah. It gives them into this domain of natural science, which is really, really cool. And that yes. to me is one of the really fun things to do. And as you learn about that, the cool thing I think that it happens is you get two effects. One is that it gives you a framework for understanding what might be happening with that other person in front of you. Mm -hmm. When you, you gives them a, an additional lens to view their behavior through. And that's really, really cool. And the other thing that it gives you is the ability to understand what's happening to you. Yeah. So when you think about what's going on in your brainstem and in your limbic system, and as that information gets to your frontal cortex, and you're trying to make sense of what's going on at lower, lower areas of your brain, it gives you the ability to pause and think before you act. Yes. Critical skill, right? Like Absolutely. critical skill in, in every environment. For all of us. <laughs> yeah. Whether you're in a board meeting, whether you are in front of a child in a classroom, whether you're a child in a classroom facing a math problem, <laughs> the ability to pause and think and check in with your internal state before you take the next action is a critical skill to be yeah. effective in, in this world. And that's why we have a frontal cortex. Yes. So I, for me, I, those, those aha moments are so fun to produce and so fun to have Yeah. as, as a person. Uh, that's kind of the fun draw for me a lot of, of doing training on trauma-informed care, using the, the concepts from it, uh, producing that kind of interaction with somebody. Super fun. The, to, to, a, a good question for you. When, when you did, I know you've done some really cool stuff with heart monitors uh, in different settings. Did, did you relay, and if you did, how did you see the, the effects of it, relay the data that you were getting to the people wearing the heart monitors? The, the, mm -hmm. I think you were working, I, I knew you were doing this, I think, with, with kids and teenagers. Just kind of how did you use yeah. that data to help folks gain insight on, on their own sort of emotions and behaviors? Absolutely. What we did is we thought of it, I'll be notorious for giving a long answer to a short question, <laughs> but we'll kind of go back a little bit, right? Where, yeah. and here's some of this blend of what's a, a typically thought of as a behavioral approach where we're talking about what somebody does yeah. and what's an inside the skin approach, which we think is a non-behavioral approach. And I think the lines between those two are getting blurrier, you know, more and more blurry as we, as we get more information. What we thought was, one of the reasons why behavioral interventions are considered so effective is that it takes a phenomena that everybody has access to so that we can all talk about, right? Part of it yeah. is defining behavior so that we can measure it. So that when everybody sees it, they know what, they have the same concept of what that behavior is, right? So if we're treating self-injury, yeah. we write down what does self-injury look like? And we define yeah. it out in terms of the physical actions. And when it comes to inside the skin, that's more difficult because only one person has access to that. Right. And so what we did is we took, uh, we've used both um, pulse oximeters to be able, if somebody didn't want to wear a heart rate strap, uh, we've used the wrist monitors. Okay. And we've used heart rate straps. Yeah. And basically what it does is that if, if the person is either looking at a number on a pulse ox, or they're looking at a number on a wrist unit, then it takes an inside the skin event and brings it outside the skin. So everybody has access to it now. Yeah. It's a number. Yes. So then we can tie that to the arousal continuum very quickly. Right? We can tie it to 
you know, we'll take a baseline measure and go, oh, we are at 100, you live at 120. Yeah. Some of my favorite stories are having a teenager, uh, specifically I'm remembering a young uh, teenage girl who was sitting in my office with her clinician. I was the clinical director at the time, and I was teaching this clinician kind of how to do this. And we're having a calm, collected, really cool conversation and I'm asking her a few questions. She's sitting relaxed in a chair, big fluffy chair in my office. And I said to her after about three minutes of the conversation, I said, I just wanna pause real quickly and I wanna check in with your internal state. Could you look at your wristwatch and tell me what your heart rate, what the number is? 127. Mm. Just sitting there, right? So then yeah. we thought that was a way to start talking then about the difference between state and trait. Yeah. I'm like, oh, so you now have a trait where you live at 127. If I'm at 127, I'm jogging. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> well, I'm really scared. Like, so I'm alert. I'm like, I'm scanning the environment for danger and I'm driven to bring that down. And she lived there. So yes. she was scanning the environment for danger all the time. Yeah. And, and she was actually exhibiting a lot of dissociative symptoms where she was not organized by danger cues enough, right? She wasn't paying attention, organized by environmental events, which is yep. a definition of dissociation. And, and so she was driven when her heart rate came down, she was driven to get it back up. Yeah. To get back to her homeostasis, to get yep. back to that, to that trait. And so that was where you get all these symptoms described as people causing crisis. Yeah. But it's really a drive to get your heart rate back up to where you are. And you have to like you have to take action to do that. Yes. And so you get driven. Yes. Uh, does that, does that kind of answer the, the question? Uh, absolutely. And, and I just think, I mean, the, the fact that we're starting to get the technology and, um, you know, Kurt, I know you, we've done some amazing work on this. Uh, to, to get that sort of immediate feedback from folks um, and use that as a teaching tool to, to help them understand some of their behaviors as well, because that's what, you know, I think the, what, what I've seen really, uh, some of the power of analogy just from, from a, a guy who does a lot of teaching right now, again, across a lot of different spectrums is analogies and stories hit people in a different way. And that's where, you know, as, as I had the opportunity to, to really train, you know, uh, folks in services, uh, you know, I had this experience too in, with the Cleveland School District. I've been working with them for several years. Um, and, and they have, uh, the, the program I work with, one of their things is they work with uh, families experiencing homelessness. Um, so they work with the family and the kid. And, you know, I, I ran this um, training. It was, for, it was basically for the parents that had to come in and they didn't have to come in, but I love this. I love this carrot that they stuck out there. So imagine that you're a parent of a, a young elementary school kid and the, the kid comes home with a flyer that says, if you go hear Mad Talk for 90 minutes, you'll, you're, you and your kid can go see LeBron James and the Cavs the next weekend for a Christmas dinner. So while they did have to come, can you imagine your kid saying, I don't want to go to this because, you know, I know we're going to miss LeBron. Right. But right. Right. You know, so it's kind of a captive audience. But, you, you know, it was, it was, you know, while we weren't using the heart rate monitor, you know, talking to them about their neurobiology. And one of the things I really realized through all my experiences is, folks living this get this you know i, I bet the, the the young lady yeah could understand that state and that feeling in some way and putting a number by it well, can be a really powerful thing and, and so i was talking to these um parents they're mostly mostly there were a few men in the room but it was a pretty large room and, and you know it just like i went into the brain talked about the amygdala you know kind of my 15 minute sweep by the brain and, and gave some analogies um, to, to help them understand the role of stress and, and emotions and behaviors. And, and there was this group uh, of about a dozen um, ladies up there. And I was kind of talking to one people and these, these ladies were kind of gathered in a group. And, and when I walked up to them, you know, I was kind of at the end that they were all kind of sharing, um, you know, they were all kind of comparing A scores in some ways and they were all like really high. Um, and they all realized that they had all been sexually assaulted or, or molested uh, before the age of 10. Uh, and that's what this group shared. And, you know, over and over, it's like, you know, I've just never understood myself. And I, I had no idea how to understand my kid, even though I saw a lot of the same behaviors. Mm -hmm. I had no idea. And it's like, you, you know, the other piece of feedback that I was like, okay, we got to figure this out was 
I understand why my case manager or my, my, the worker I'm working with, the counselor, uh, keeps suggesting mental health therapy. It's like I never really understood why this, how this might benefit, but really, you know, understanding the biological damage uh, that experienced and how that manifested in its own life you know, just created that understanding for some of them for the first time. And I followed up with the program and they actually registered several people um, afterwards more than they usually do. And, and so just to kind of see that, okay, you know, it's like, it's not just kind of that message that there's something just wrong with me. And if I just wanted to do something different, I could, that there's a biological injury there that needs healed. And I thought, you know, between, you know, I realize that I'm not a bad person and I understand why I need mental health therapy, how a little bit, because I, like I said, I don't have eight days with these people. I, I had 90 minutes with one, you know, a little longer with the other group, but it was just amazing to see the, the level of insight with, with just a little bit of uh, knowledge on the brain and their biology. And I thought that was fascinating to see such great returns on, yeah. on yeah. a short investment. Yeah, I've certainly seen that as well and have, have heard people talk a lot about how it's a different approach to take instead of talking about things that are unpleasant to talk about. And really, we, you know, like we're kind of shifting the focus from what's wrong with you to what happened to you. Absolutely. And, that, and that's a big shift. As, and then as we talk about what are the underlying mechanisms behind your, what drives you yeah, like to, to seek out and those drives like are, are what will function in behavioral words, right? Would be what will function as a reinforcer for your behavior. Yes. And they tie those two things together. And we understand that I mean, some of the fun ones are for children, of course, um, some of the competing ideas between traditionally behavioral approaches and a trauma informed approach is what do you do in the crisis moment? Yeah. Right. And this is a lot of Dan Siegel's work, right? Where he says, yeah you're not going to spoil a child by giving them more attention. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, if they probably need co-regulation during the crisis. Yeah. Uh, and then a lot of the trauma folks will say, well, yes, we need structure. And they're right, right? They'll be like, and yes, we need structure. We need programs. And like, yes. That's ABA. Like, that's yes. what we do, right? Like, yeah. We have reward programs. We have yep. <laughs> positive behavior support systems, right? Do them all day long. Yes. And then do this other thing as well. So it's yeah. not like, the ideas of, of and you know, you talking to Jerry, right? He says this a lot, right? If you're, don't you have to throw away everything that you were doing? Yeah, add to your understanding of it. And Absolutely. It. And and that's kind of I think the process that happens is when we start talking about a, a way to understand some of these drives and way to understand that what is functioning as a motivator for you, it it doesn't mean that you're crazy. Yeah. It means that you've gone through things that produce those drives. Absolutely. And, like even understanding them doesn't necessarily make them go away. Yeah. But it helps you put them into context. Exactly. Exactly. And and the other piece of, of the sort of the equation that I also find interesting, and even though the 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 first book I wrote talk especially usually motivational interviewing, which is uh, a real language for helping folks consider uh, and make changes, is you know I, I think a lot of folks just that, that I found just don't understand why it's so hard to make big changes in their life. Why, why it's so hard to, you know, and, and I, I don't think it, our society as a whole doesn't have this information readily available that, you know, in some ways changing habits that you've had for years means changing the physical structure of your brain. <laughs> and that, you know, when, when I talk to folks that are struggling, especially with addiction, cause boy, you don't get anybody that beats themselves up more, um, than somebody who's struggled the, the horrors of addiction a lot of times, you know, just that little bit, okay, so my brain gets hardwired around this behavior and then my brain becomes very predictive and I'm really good at doing what I did yesterday and the day before and the day before. And then, you know, I talked to a little bit about how then, then you throw opiates or dopamine or whatever the drug does in there. And it's like, yeah, somebody bites their teeth. This is like you bite your teeth and you feel awesome or at least, uh, you feel awesome at first, but you're at least relieving pain. It's looking at it as a coping skill that's logical before it became harmful as an addiction. And, you know, all of a sudden it's like, oh, maybe I I'm not as effed up as, 
you know, I've sort of thought and, and people have told me throughout kind of my life, obviously not in services, but, you know, they get that message so much. And it's just like, we, you know, how can we do a better job of if, if the brain has changed our thinking, how do we package that? And I'm even thinking like, how do we teach first graders uh, a little bit about their neurobiology, whether it's stress, trauma, emotions, um, change behavior, and boy, if we became brain literate, brain literate, um, <laughs> how would that change our perspectives of ourselves? Because I'm sure that all this work that you've done, I look at myself differently at, at times, um, yeah. all the time, really, at this point. But yeah, yeah. But yeah I, I just kind of wonder, and the, the question to you is, what, what do you think brain literacy um, uh, for, for, for kids and, and then into adults and families uh, how could how do you see that as a potential game changer yeah uh we'll go back to an experience i had as an undergraduate at utah state they have a school on on site at, like most universities do yeah. right they have a school they have a teacher training program school psych program so they have a school and uh i think it's considered an experimental school something like that right yeah but one of my professors who taught me behavior analysis basically one of the things he did is for a third grade classroom he and one of his doctoral students uh, created a curriculum for understanding behavior mm -hmm. and they taught third graders how to understand behavior awesome and it made a big difference in their behavior both in the classroom and at home yeah it, it, I mean one way to even understand that is that it created shared language between the child and the parent or the teacher who's managing their behavior yeah and so they got to think about understanding their own behavior and understanding another child's behavior in the classroom. And I think the same thing happens with being brain literate. Yeah. And as we get more people involved in understanding, I mean, one of the great things you, I've heard kids say over the, over the years is you teach them the structure of their brain and what, like the, the amygdala is functioning to make it, you know, yeah. their impulse and, and their emotions be activated, right? Like they're yeah. on fire today. Yes. They start, you, you know, they're ready to move into cognitive intervention when they say it wasn't my fault, it was my amygdala. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, all right, okay, we're good on the regulation and the education piece. Now let's go into some more cognitive intervention. Exactly. But but what I was like, I, I think what, what the words you just said, like for them, and I teach, you know, different analogies that are, you know, the cup analogy is one that I've taught. And we'll, we'll talk more about that in coming weeks, but I present that in the book too. But, you know, to say, I, I kind of think about, it, and you may appreciate this as a behavioralist of, in my programs, especially before I got this knowledge, but I, I still think this is kind of the paradigm we operate under, is when, when you, like, I've got a kid that's angry, right? Pissed off. Something happened. I don't know what happened. And what would be my programmatic expectations of this kid? Some a kid, let's just say with trauma, some mental health issues. Um, let's just say they're sitting in a school classroom and they blow up. You know, really my program's designed because I want the kid to respond this way. You, you know, teacher, I, I'm getting a little stressed out right now. And <laughs> I, I think if uh, my, 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 my cortisol is pulsing through my brain, and if I think my first coping skills should be take some mindful deep breaths, and if that doesn't work, maybe go out in the hallway to change my environment and really focus on my long-term goals and how my current behavior is going to impact my long-term <laughs> goals. And if I'm still angry, maybe I can take a run or two around the building to replace some of that cortisol with some endorphins so I can really come back into class and engage in this important lesson you're teaching. Like, you know, it sounds- What adult can do that. <laughs> I know, exactly. <laughs> but, but I set programs up, like, and, you know, behavioral supports, if you look at them, you know, my question to all of our listeners is, what are you really asking your folks to do? And, and where I found with this, the, the psychoeducation on the brain, um, behaviors is if I can say my amygdala's bro, you know, my amygdala is uh, alarming or I, the cup analogy, my cup's filling up. Yeah. I think that there is a, an ability for, for folks, uh, again, with histories of trauma, which can have some language development issues as well. I may be able to use an analogy or a body part where I can't say right now would be some really, a really good opportunity for me to practice <laughs> mindfulness as a way to yes, <laughs> my own emotions. <laughs> um, and I just think if we can give folks the language, and like you said, that shared language, um, you know, uh, w what greater gift can we give folks? Yeah, and, yeah. And, and I would hope eventually, if when they said, you know, my cup's filled up, then we train the staff to say, okay, 
I'm not going to logically engage this individual at time. I need to give the person some space uh, right. and right. Let, let them cool off. Um, so, so there are real realistic interventions when they can verbalize even just you know, that, that the analogy of it to begin with. Yeah, yeah. I mean, a couple of fun stories about those you, you brought to my mind uh, um, that have become stories I've used for now a couple of years at least. <laughs> um, and, and one is when we started using heart rate monitors. Yeah. Um, we started to uh, have the people who are wearing the monitors, and this was in a residential setting, yeah, school setting, what we started to do is to use the positive behavior support reward system as a motivator for checking in with your internal state and asking, communicating what your number was to a teacher or to a paraprofessional or a direct care staff on the unit, and then making a decision, a collaborative decision about what to do next given that number. Yeah. So, and we're saying, like, we're just gonna give you your points that you can trade in for later, right? As a yeah. reason, we'd use the motivator yes. to get the relational intervention to happen right. and, the, and the regulating event to happen, yeah. right? So it was kind of fun to be able to say that and be like, listen, we're just gonna give you what you want and we're gonna give you points for it. Yeah. So it was shifting the interventions. I called it shifting it developmentally. Yeah. Where we were giving it, using, using a, a motivational intervention to what was a motivational problem. Yeah. But if we're asking a, a child in the classroom to do something that they aren't developmentally ready to do, then it's not a motivational problem. So applying a motivational intervention isn't really going to work. Right. Exactly. So we shifted the motivational intervention to where it was within their repertoire of skills that they could do and what they needed. Yeah. And then the motivational intervention matched up with the motivational problem nature of, yeah. of what was needed to happen. And then it works. <laughs> Yeah. So we would have lots of that happening. I mean, I mean, some fun ones that we've done, that's really fun in classrooms. Um, we looked at, I mean, here's a functional behavior assessment one. We didn't even have heart rate at this point. Yeah. But works great. What we saw is we just did a functional behavior assessment and found out that at least the, the probabilities were that what was motivating uh, a child's elopement and aggression symptoms in a yeah. classroom was that uh, it was escape. Mm. I was getting out of the classroom or, or getting away from an unpleasant task. That's yeah. what kind of generated it. And so what we, and this was a, a young man with autism. Yeah. And, and so one of the things with autism is, is being very, very rule governed. Yeah. And so this, this, this child was actually pushing himself so hard that he would become overwhelmed with the task when he couldn't do it. And then having the thought or the idea of, I'm not, I'm going to fail. Yeah. It was so difficult, it generated this big stress response. We get a big, big explosion. We get tearing up a classroom, throwing over desks, or running out in the hallway, right? <laughs> Ending up in, in probably a restraint. Right? Yeah. And, or, or somebody getting hit. And so what we did is we said, we need to find out about how often this happens. And then we're going to basically divide the day into intervals based on an average of occurrence per day. And mm -hmm. we're going to give you your positive behavior support rewards for taking a break before you get to that point. Great. All right. So yeah. it's just, we're going to give you your points for doing yeah. what you want. Yeah. Right? It was applying the motivational intervention to, the mot to a motivational problem. Yeah. And I mean, the rapid decline. I, I, I know tons of people can tell stories like that. Yeah. Um, that, that it just worked really, really, really well when we can get that kind of shared language about what's happening. Absolutely. And, and you know, I talk to, you know, one of my, my hopes for the future of education, because I hear this so often um, with, with those that I do when I train at schools, but it's, you know, to have that flexibility, um, it's a challenge. It, it takes a really sort of, as I like to say, a, a healthy system with enough capacity not to rely on the rigid structures that we've traditionally used. Mm -hmm. and, and it's interesting to hit sometimes it's like, you know, occasionally, this is the exception and by far not the rule, but I'll have usually somebody in administration, it, it, teachers get this, but they, they're just worried that, you know, I've got a classroom of 25 and I've got four of these kids. How do I, how do I help regulate all those while teaching the other? And I was like, e we need to advocate for more resources in the classroom. <laughs> it's my answer to that because I don't, I don't have a, a, a perfect answer to that, but it's like, 
a lot of times I've seen this in residential care as well. It's like we're so ingrained with these old ways of thinking. So even though when, when we got proof that the, the science doesn't support the, the old ways like I did because they don't have the biological ability or the developmental ability yet to really express themselves in the way we sort of want. Mm -hmm. it, it's a real challenge to us to say, how can we be more flexible? And that may mean that one kid in class gets away with something another kid doesn't get away with. And I think that's really hard for us to sort yeah. of, yeah. sort of handle. It's like, the you questions know, are, know, are, are notions of justice and fairness. Exactly. I, I mean, but, but that's a hard thing. And that's why we just, you know, I, I think the, the thinking in our higher cognitive self needs to come out of mm -hmm. saying, okay, let's have this discussion of what this means and how do we, how you communicate that to other second graders that you're going to treat Matt different than Kurt because Matt's going through some stuff and, and Matt, Matt needs a little, little different intervention than Kurt does. And, and, and that, I mean, nothing about this doesn't challenge us in some way, shape or form, but. Yeah, certainly some of the things that, I mean, your question is a great one, right? What do you do when you have a classroom of even 12? Yeah. Right. Yes. And you've got all 12 of them. Yeah. They have a lot of, a lot of need. Yes. And so how you structure the day yeah. in an environment that is really, really important. And a couple of quick the little kind of rules that um, I've learned over the years and applied with, with a lot of fun success is dividing out even each hour into doing something regulatory, doing something relational, and yeah. doing something cognitive. But you, get a, you can do all of those things. Yeah. And I've done this with um, picture schedules for kids on the autism spectrum. We've done it with words for kids who don't need pictures. Um, and actually just generating a schedule where it's like, I need to do something regulatory. So on my, like I talk about even very, very um, severely affected people with autism yeah. spectrum disorder. Uh, we use picture schedules a lot with that. Where yes, absolutely. Um, trade it from one side of a card to another side. But having a little picture of, I need to go push on a wall. And if one kid yeah. loves to do that, right? We called it, I need to hold up the wall. Yeah. And he'd go over and then engage large muscle groups. That was a regulatory event for this young man. Doing something relational where uh, for him, uh, I'll go with this one kid. Um, we basically gave him 100 compliments. And he could go pick which person in the classroom he needed to go give a compliment to <laughs> and scroll through his list of 100 That's and learn awesome. how to go over and engage with somebody socially by saying something nice. Yeah. Or by going over and asking a question about something somebody was interested in. So yeah. things that would then kind of trap the social interaction and like people love to talk to you when you want to listen to them. Yeah. People love to talk to you when you say something nice at the beginning of the conversation. Uh, so, and then something cognitive, right? So we yeah. would do math or we would do reading. So we would tie in the academics in there because it was a classroom. Yep. Right. So that was to speak to the, to the education side and, and, and the, the goals of a classroom, which is to do academic intervention. We Absolutely. need to get to that, at, you know, sometimes during the day. Yeah. So those are things I think that are, um, things to kind of think about when we look at classroom design and environment yeah. design positive repetitive events that are targeted developmentally and we put them into the structure and schedule them out. Yeah. Those can be really, they're super effective. Yeah. And, and, and you know, as you were talking about that too, I, I think in some ways it's easier maybe for us to think about children with those sort of interventions, but man, the adults, I yeah. had a great day yesterday at the Aurora Day Resource Center. Um, a new day shelter uh, for, for those experiencing homelessness. And it was like, it really cool. Cause I, I went out and trained them on trauma before they opened their doors. Oh, and yeah. now, now they're six months in and, and walking in, they got this gym that they've created this beautiful space with showers and laundry and, you know, allowing people to be human beings and spend the day with people who care and welcome them in. And, and again, I, I think about what a lot of those folks need that have years of, you know, have, have been in, have never had a chance to recover and heal from their trauma, have a, you know, don't forget about A scores at this point, because all the trauma with homelessness and addiction as well. And, and really, you know, we're working with that group of how do we set our expectations and our interventions at their, where they're at developmentally as well. Granted, they're not developing, you know, as, as far as children and child development concerned, but, but a lot of them, due to their addiction and trauma, that their neurobiology is 
back in earlier levels. They, they may have not have developed much outside their teenage years. And, you know, how, how do we help them? How do we create environments where they can thrive too? And those interventions look a lot different, like we said, than just talking somebody sort of down in de-escalation. Um, and so being that, that creative piece, um, I think is really, really critical. Yeah. And then, and then the other thing too, that um, I, I'm sort of interested in get, getting your thoughts on and, and because it was a big reason why I wrote, wrote the, the follow-up book was, you know, how does, if you think about somebody that, that has that complex trauma, that has the high adverse childhood experience scores, that they're, they're struggling with all this, you know, what role does self-understanding, it's sort of that know thyself, uh, I, was that the Parthenon? So, some, some ancient structure had that outside. I, I think it was Greek. And I think you're quoting yeah. the Bible now, Matt. I don't know, it was on the Matrix. So that, that's all, <laughs> you know, it was on the Oracle's doorway. So there, there's, there's your history from that. Uh, <laughs> but but I, I just kind of wonder what the, like, self-insight is so critical. And from the behavioral perspective, I'd be interested in this, like, you know, the more I understand me, the more I understand my behaviors, the more I understand what's a biological injury and maybe mm -hmm. things that I can eventually start to gain some control over and just kind of mm -hmm. wondered, mm -hmm. uh, what, what's some of your thoughts about understanding and the healing process? Yeah, I think um, often I go to the, uh, we talked about a, a slide image with um, different events that affect the reward centers of the brain. And there are lots of those events, right? I, was, I think we did this on the five R's episode, maybe three episodes ago, right? So there are some of the easy ones, alcohol, obviously, right? Drugs of abuse, they all activate reward centers in the brain, yeah. which is why they become addictive. Um, we get the same kind of dopamine rush when we check our phones. Yeah. Right? So we get social interaction that way. Um, changes in physiological state can also activate that. So getting excited can be like activate the reward center, becoming calm can activate the reward center. And one of the really interesting ones that is on that slide, and this is fun in the, in the literature, is behaving consistent with an internal set of rules. Mm, yeah. Activates a reward center in the brain. And that's really cool, right? So yeah. and we're in, in, and in the behavioral language, we talk about two big categories of behavior. There's probably more than that, right? Like, <laughs> As they say, I like models, two. I can probably remember two. All models are wrong. Some are useful. <laughs> so so far, this has been useful, at least to me. So one of them is what we call contingency shaped behavior. Right? So when I go stick my finger in a light socket, I just found out what happens. Right? I contacted yeah. a contingency between my behavior and an environmental event. So I'm not likely to go do that again because it hurt. Now, if if you tell me, I've never seen a light socket before and you point over there and go, hey, let me give you a little tip. Don't ever stick your finger in that because if you do, it's really going to hurt. Yes. <laughs> You've just given me a rule. Yeah. And if I never stick my finger in that light socket, what, what the thing that produced that change is very different. Yeah. I, I, now you gave me a rule to follow as opposed to me going and finding out what happened. Yeah. And as we understand ourselves, we start to generate more of these rules. Mm -hmm. I don't, human beings, we all know we do this, right? Yeah. We generate rules for situations all the time. We verbalize them in our head. We talk to our friends about them. And when people violate our own rules, that's when we go, what were they thinking? Yeah. Right? So it's <laughs> always that experience. Yeah. And human beings are so good at that. Yeah. It really makes us very, very effective because we don't have to go find out that like a dog, right? They experience the world through their nose. Yes. Right. So that's why a dog will go get a quill, uh, go sniff a porcupine over and over again and get a face full of quills a lot. Yes. Because they, that's how they experience the world. We experience the world with our frontal cortex. We have an experience simulator. Yeah. And it makes us really, really effective because we don't have to go try out all these dangerous things to find out that they're not a good idea. We can, yeah. We can follow rules. We can imagine what would happen if we did that. And doing that, so when we understand ourselves and generate these rules about interacting with the world, and when we behave consistently with them, we feel good. Yeah. And, and that, that functions as a reinforcer. Yeah, and it, it, that just really goes hand in hand. I was actually teaching this yesterday when I was training folks on uh, motivational interviewing is 
one of the things that, that MI has really taught me, and, and I was reading this, um, and it goes along with that rules, it's the values we live uh, our lives by, which is really, to me, the, those core central things that, that you know, if, if we express them and say them, they, they should guide our behavior. And one of the things I, I like about what MI's done is it talks about that cognitive distance for that, you know, being uncomfortable with the status quo in your current situation, or being uncomfortable that you're not realize there's unrealized potential out there that you're not realizing through your current behaviors. And, and so, but, but when they looked at what really causes this cognitive dissonance, it's, it's when you recognize that your behavior is out of line with your values mm -hmm. and the more it's out of line and you realize that the more it pulls you uh, into motivation for change. And one of the things that, that I've had, I, I do this with professionals at times and, um, put it in a format, um, including the book, about how you help people in, you know, services. I think this can be probably as young as later elementary school. Talk about what are the rules they live their life by. Well, what are their, what are their values? There's some value sheets out there. And once you get those established, now you have a real baseline to help them, uh, you know, kind of how's your behavior either helping you live your values or, or not helping you? What is, if changing behavior, how would that help you get, live a life that are aligned with your values? And I, you know, the, the joke is I wrote these down myself about seven or eight years ago. Now I, I was like, no, it just seemed like this, you know, touchy feely exercise to write down your values. And it's changed a ton in my yeah. life. Like yeah. I'm not saying it's always good changes. There's some things that I miss um, uh, with some of the values I've had, but you know, I know I'm healthier when I live in line with my values and I'm, I'm more fulfilled. And usually though, sometimes I have to give things up that I really love. Um, at the same time, I feel better overall and I'm usually living healthier when I do that. So, you know, I, I always encourage people um, to talk about, you know, have people, because our assessment sometimes can be so negative, what are the rules you live your life by? What, what do you value most in life? What would your friends say are, are the rules that guide your behavior? And it gives you such a deep understanding of people in that way. And so I, I would support that, that that's an effective tool, uh, talking about those rule pieces. Um, yeah. yeah, you're and, reminding me of um, dialectical behavior therapy. Yeah. And yeah. one of the, the post measures of, I think uh, this came out of uh, Linehan's lab and in, in uh, in Seattle that uh, after a uh, suicide attempt, if, obviously it, was, it didn't work if you're talking to the person yes. afterwards, right? Um, one of the things that is always a, at least a post uh, attempt intervention is to do an assessment called the reasons for living scale. Mm. And basically it says, what was the thought that kept you alive? And it was, it, it, it really is, it was a thinking about a loved one? Was it responsibility for children? I mean, there's yeah. several different questions. It's like you rate them and it starts to generate this idea of what do I value and what am I living for and, and what's guiding my behavior, right? It's a pretty yeah. linear progression between all of those things when you think about I and mean, that is really questioning your own existence. Yeah. And what leads you, why do you exist all the way into what guides my behavior in every single moment? So that connection, I think, is a really, really cool one. Absolutely. I got one more question I'd, I'd love for us to tackle with the time left. And, and it's one that I, I obviously have an investment in because it's basically the reason why I've got two books out now, which I'm still <laughs> excited to say. Um, but, but I'm really, all this in some ways, um, all of our conversation today, and, when, and in some ways, really why we're doing the Trauma-Informed Lens podcast is that I, I think in some ways, one of my goals is to help people become both trauma informed, but also brain literate, um, as I, I could probably find a better way than brain literate to describe it. But, you know, if, if we agree, I think, I think we're in agreement. I know Jay would agree with us. The better you understand yourself and your biology, it, it can lead to insight. I think it can help further along the healing process because I think it's easier to, for some people at least to overcome the shame associated with uh, past trauma or the resulting events due to, you know, kind of the symptoms of trauma and the biology. But really realize this potential that lies there. 
I really believe that in the, in the, especially in the next 10 years, but I, I think it should be a pretty urgent thing on people's, you know, professional development list and organizations is getting staff, whether that's teachers, whether that's uh, treat, youth treatment counselors working on the floor, foster parents, administrators, brain literate. And I kind of want to get your thoughts on that as somebody who talks a lot about the brain, knowing that it's, again, I think still the most complex thing we've ever found in the universe. And we, we, I, I learned there was whole journals on like the hippocampus now. Like, think about that. One part of the brain has its own journal. Uh, yeah. I just kind of wonder, like, with all this information, and we do deep dive times into the real polyvagal theory, which you still have to explain yeah. at this point. Um, but what do you think the level of the professional that, that, that's working and having conversations, whether it's a teacher, a counselor, what do you think about uh, neuro, you know, brain literacy and how it can really help improve our services? Yeah, I think two things come to mind. And one is, I'll go with the kind of the nuts and bolts one first. And that is that it's useful to the extent that it translates into, into, into different actions when we're yeah. in, the, in the environment, right? So that's kind of what I put a lot of my effort to. Um, uh, uh, Jerry has kindly said that, my superpower is I can operationalize almost anything. <laughs> and so I can take all these concepts and go, so what do I do tomorrow? Yes. And so being able that, it's useful to that extent. Yeah. In some sense. In the other sense, I think that one of the really great things that could come out of it, not just tomorrow, but really into the future, is it starts to generate a lot more creativity. Yeah. And a lot more things like, oh, if we did this, this would happen. Or if we did this, if we understood this, then this would happen. Yeah. And the more people that you can, the more brains essentially that you can and engage in that, the more creativity that there is. Yeah. And so having, uh, for me, that's the big kind of future benefit of, of education about the brain, education about neurobiology, is that it starts to inform what we can do creatively to help people in yeah. a long-term sense of it. And that's been one of the funnest and most rewarding things for me professionally. I think most of the stories I told today were things that came out of clinical supervision when yeah. I was teaching somebody else these things and they were like, oh, well, what if we did this? I'm like, go, do, yeah. have yeah. at it. Like, I wouldn't have thought of that. Great. Yes. Like, I'll support it all day long. How much money? <laughs> go. Uh, so I, I, those are kind of the thoughts that come to my head about what's the real, the real value in it and what are our targets, right? Is yeah. It, creativity yeah. and that should be a target and is it what should I do tomorrow yeah exactly exactly and, and you know I said it you know in, in more of a treatment center setting where you've got lots of different levels of staff I, I sort of I've, I've been kind of thinking about that because it, education again you've got the, the sort of especially in elementary school the teacher in the classroom though that changes throughout but trying to think about you know could you have some sort of meta level experts of you know, and I think a lot of people coming out of graduate degrees in psychology and other things are getting a lot of this neurobiology now. But, but have people, I think there's a level of comfortability with this. And this, just so you, our listeners know, this took me years of, I, I had a few books I just listened to. Oh, D Daniel Siegel's Mindful Brain audio book. I had those four CDs. That's how long I've had this. I had CDs back at the time. And I just listened to those over and over again. So I learned how to pronounce amygdala. <laughs> if you want to know where I started, it was in there like amygdala. Uh, vagal was one of the, you know, and vagus nerve. If you pronounce that wrong, it's not good to do in front of a lot of people, uh, <laughs> which I was at first. Uh, so I had to just learn how to pronounce these parts. Then much dive into, we haven't even gotten to these action potentials and dendrites and axons to, to really grab this understanding. So having a few people, whether it's in a, a school, I think treatment settings are a little easier for me to visualize. And then really asking the question of what level, level of brain literacy mm -hmm. do we want to have mm -hmm. throughout our system? Mm -hmm. and, and there be a basic level of that from everybody. And I, I love to train the accounting people on stuff like this. I, they find it fascinating. Like yeah. they understand the, the people they're working with better in their work. And, and so having that basic uh, baseline, so we all have, as, as we talk about all the time, that shared language. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and then sort of thinking about, okay, if we have these kind of, kind of meta experts who hopefully feel comfortable with training, 
really, uh, whether it's developing curriculum in schools or, or doing psychoeducational groups um, in other settings, getting that language then to those that, that we're serving. So I, I envision like an elementary school curriculum from, from K or even pre-K on, on to fifth grade, and then obviously uh, up through high school as well, building on that. But, you know, how, how can we teach that chunks? And that's where I think analogies, one of the analogies of the book is like an elephant and a rider, where the elephant's the emotional brain and the rider's an intellectual brain. And it's a really great way, no. I, I think, to have any level of, uh, you know, you, you can be, you know, five or six and kind of get that if you train the right way. And right. so having this real, this, this neurodevelopment, again, having a level of literacy within the organization, kind of like with trauma, that understanding, I think the two go hand in hand really well. And, and then figuring out, how, okay, now we've got the shared language of staff. How do we then start to train um, the clients or students or patients that we're working with? Um, and now we're all talking that same language. And, yeah. you know, I think there's some real inherent challenges there because, again, I'm – I, I, every time I stand up and talk about the brain, it's like, man, has another study come out in hippocampus journal uh, mm -hmm. that I don't know about. But mm -hmm. I think that there's some kind of higher, we know the amygdala is associated with emotion. And I think 25 years from now, there'll be volumes of books written on the amygdala, but it will still be sort of the fear-based fight or flight uh, a piece of it. So, you know, asking ourselves what we need to understand, what level, and then uh, really getting that out. I, I, well, that was the real that was the real genius i think of the neurosequential model and, and yeah. it was Perry's model right As he 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 wrote it into six principles yeah and we need to understand the principles and a little bit of the neurobiology that drives the principles but yeah. you don't have to know everything exactly in order for it to make some sense and yeah. be able to guide some action so i i thought that was the genius thing right about the yeah. model is there are six principles and if you teach those six principles you got a pretty good shared language about how we can start to talk to each other and then there will be people who will take the deep dives into understanding how all the connections work and getting all the updated information. But there is a, a baseline level of, of understanding based on some principles and some concepts. Absolutely. And I, I think, again, it shows if we can tell this through stories and analogies, um, I just think it's so much more graspable for folks. One of the, one of the sort of the, the other cool things is I, if you see me train on trauma, I, I use Joseph Campbell's hero's journey for a lot of this. And I, I think one of my big most powerful experiences is, you know, I can make a really, and I think it's an easy justification to make is that people that have especially survived. And most people that I train have survived incredibly complex trauma um, that, that, they are heroes. I mean, they've survived things that have many people don't survive. Um, and so their struggles are part of that journey um, because they haven't gotten the help and the resources they need to fully recover from it. But, you know, to watch somebody, and this is, I, I think, the biggest takeaway uh, of, of working with folks to understand trauma is taking somebody who just uh, kind of maybe feels like a victim um, or doesn't feel like a worthy person or just is carrying around so much shame. And by giving them a model to look at trauma as not a state that's going to go on forever, but as part of an overall journey and that if we accept the right resources and support um, and, and build trusting relationships, um, that, that our biology changes over time and, and having them, you know, and I don't say right out the bat, I think you're all heroes. I want them to kind of get to that conclusion is, you know, even if they're on the early stages of, of the struggles of the hero's journey to see, okay, you know, I can really, there's this opportunity. Um, and I'm always honest, if you do the hard work to turn that pain and suffering into, you know, real strength and wisdom um, that, that will make you a better parent, that, that, will, that, that will give you strength throughout the rest of your life. And I think as I, and, and I don't know if I hit everybody like this, because probably the people that I don't hit don't come up and tell me how awesome the experience was in the training. But, but you know, to, to, to communicate to them that they're not victims, they're not bad, they're not addicts, they're not homeless, they're people on this journey. Uh, you know, I, I always joke is if somebody sent on a half million dollars of grant funding, I would love to see the long term outcomes of just that change in mindset for folks um and it's it's a change that boy 
I hope we can get to people earlier, earlier in their life. So because some of the people I work with, even though I've worked with teenagers, might be in their 60s or 70s. And with somebody that age that I know and shares a history of complex childhood trauma says, for the first time in my life, I realize I'm not a bad person. It's like, you know, part of me is like awesome. And the other part of me is like, man, I wish we could have gotten this to you, you know, 50 years earlier. Uh, but, but hey, you know, we, we start with where the science is. So that, that was just kind of one of the, the more powerful things is, you know, helping people understand this again through the science, because I think it shows the biological injury and it's not a kind of, they're a bad person sort of mentality, but also showing that, that it's a real strength to gain resiliency and wisdom as well. I think it's just a really cool thing that I'm excited to explore more and more, uh, hopefully over the next couple of years. So the theory is you write a book on something, you get to talk about it more. So um, I'm, I'm hoping that's the case, at least in, in my life. So yeah. any kind of final thoughts um, before we head out, Kurt? No, I mean, certainly your, your, your point is well taken that, that the goal of gaining greater understanding is for healing and yeah. to facilitate healing. And Absolutely. And we'll do that better and, and uh, be able to do it for a wider group of people is, is really the, the ultimate goal. Yeah. And congratulations on book number two. That's really thank awesome. Thank you. Available on Amazon, talking about <laughs> trauma and change. So um, thank you. And, and thank you guys for joining us today. Um, as always, you can find show notes, videos. Um, we're also going to, I've been thinking about our show notes a little bit too, Kurt. I, I think I'm going to, we usually use questions to kind of organize our, our conversation. So I'm going to start to post those up for discussion questions as well. So um, you can feel okay. free. Yeah, you can feel free to comment to us or I, I've gotten a lot of feedback from folks that their whole teams are listening to our podcast and then talking about it in their team meetings. So oh, great. I just um, got more nervous. That's great. Yeah, I know. I know. It's, <laughs> kind, of, it's just kind of nerve wracking. But, uh, <laughs> you know, so, so this will help because sometimes we're not the most structured uh, individuals, but I think we do a pretty good job. Uh, so, so we'll give you some of this, these, uh, these questions as well for hopefully to guide your discussions too. So again, you can find all that at trauma and uh, trauma lens, all one word, dot org, um, as well as a lot of other resources. So uh, Kurt, great talking with you today. And I just want to thank all of our listeners for, for joining us again. And uh, we will see you next week. Take care. Great. Thanks.